Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to NCSL's first in a series of five webinars on the state and federal response to COVID-19 pandemic. Today's webinar focuses on the state and federal public health response. My name is Laura Tobler, and I will be moderating the webinar today. I'm the director of NCSL's State Policy Research Division, where we're very busy responding to state legislative requests on how other states are responding to COVID-19. The spread of the coronavirus continues to be a top concern for Americans, federal, state, and local government, and increasingly state lawmakers. Policymakers are taking extra steps to respond to and anticipate impacts of the virus. NCSL is committed to providing our members with timely responses to state research requests and the essential knowledge needed to guide state action. This webinar is intended to highlight federal and state action in response to the coronavirus, as well as provide you with resources as you navigate this ever-changing and unprecedented situation. Today's webinar is a platform for information exchange and engagement. Over the next 60 minutes, we encourage participation through our chat box. So feel free to type your questions and to answer any questions in the chat box, which is in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. I want to briefly mention the resources. Above the presentation, you will see tabs with one of them labeled resources. Here you can find and download a PDF version of the PowerPoint. Another tab is labeled speaker, where you can read the bios of today's speakers. You can access these tabs at any time during the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on NCSL's website within the week. For those of you not familiar with our organization, the National Conference of State Legislators is the bipartisan organization that serves the legislators and legislative staff of the states, commonwealths, and territories. NCSL provides research, technical assistance, and opportunities for policymakers to exchange ideas on the most pressing state issues and is an effective and respected advocate for the interests of the states in the American federal system. This webinar is a platform for exchanging ideas and information, and we hope that it provides answers to your questions. NCSL developed a web page to house our comprehensive resources on the state and federal response to COVID-19. To view this information, go to NCSL's website at website at ncsl.org and uh, you'll see a banner at the top of the page and just click into our resources. You can find information on state policies and response related to continuity of government, education, fiscal, elections, criminal justice, and other important considerations during this unprecedented time. Our upcoming webinar, webinars over the next few weeks will cover these policy issues. You've registered for this webinar today, and we have um, five others to come. Um, and you can register by going to ncsl.org and clicking through to the coronavirus COVID-19 resources. Today, um, we have three speakers who will share their public health expertise with us. Remember to click on the speaker tab to read their bios. On deck first is Tara Johnson, who directs NCSL's work on public health and maternal and child health. She will provide a general overview and discuss the state legislative responses and provide some specific state examples. So take it away, Tara. Great, thank you, Laura. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. As Laura mentioned, my name is Tara Johnson and I direct our public health and maternal and child health work at NCSL. I would like to start off by thanking my colleagues, Kate Bradford and Noah Cruz, who contribute daily to our COVID-19 resources and legislative tracking in NCSL's health program. As many of you know, COVID-19 is a new disease caused by a novel or new coronavirus that has not previously been seen in humans. We know the symptoms include fever, cough, and shortness of breath, 
and it spreads mainly person to person. There is currently no vaccine to prevent the coronavirus disease, but several companies are working on developing one. The best way to prevent illness is to avoid being exposed to this virus. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds or use hand sanitizer containing at least 60% alcohol. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands. For more information, please see CDC's webpage. According to the World Health Organization, cases surpassed 332,000 globally. This is an increase of over 40,000 cases in the last 24 hours. We've seen 14,510 deaths, which is an increase of 1,770, or sorry, 1,727 in the last 24 hours. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as of yesterday, there were a total of 33,404 confirmed cases in the United States and 400 people died from COVID-19. All 50 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the U.S. Virgin Islands have reported cases. As of today, there are at least seven states with over 1,000 reported cases, including California, Illinois, Louisiana, New Jersey, New York, Michigan, and Washington State. There are many states implementing actions. Many of these are unprecedented to mitigate this pandemic. Every state declared a state of emergency or a public health emergency. And of those, at least five states submitted for a major disaster declaration. 35 states or territories have activated the National Guard. 28 states restricted employee travel, some for a specified amount of time. 52 states or territories closed schools statewide, while four have local closures. 36 states have a mixture of recommended, required, or limited closure of non-essential businesses. For example, in Colorado, the closure spe specifically requires bars, restaurants, gyms, theaters, casinos, and ski resorts to close. Restaurants are able to do takeout services only. 37 states have a mandatory statewide limitation on gatherings. At least nine states have a stay at home order. 13 states have a limit on 10 or more individuals gathering. Four states have a limit on 25 or more and eight states or territories have a limit on 50 or more. In addition to these major efforts, several states have adjusted healthcare specific policies in response. For example, 15 states require early prescription refills. At least 10 states enable, enabled a special enrollment period for the insurance marketplace. And several states waive cost sharing for treatment or waive prior authorization requirements for testing and or testing and treatment. In terms of a legislative action, we have seen quite a lot of action in the last two or three weeks. At least 31 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico have introduced legislation to support state action related to COVID-19. These include resolutions and bills that involve funding, workforce protections or medical coverage, disease surveillance, isolation and quarantine, or are related to actions taken by the governor in a state of emergency. Of these, 28 states and the District of Columbia have enacted or adopted legislation. The speed of some of these bills has been very fast, especially considering at least 23 legislatures have postponed their legislative session and three additional chambers have also postponed their legislative session. There are several trends that we saw in the proposed and enacted legislation. I'm going to share several examples related to these types of bills. Please note that NCSL does not promote or endorse any legislation. I'm uh, just sharing these as an example. We track introduced and enacted legislation across all 50 states on our webpage if you're interested in viewing more state examples. The majority of these bills introduced and enacted relate to appropriating funding. Many states propose supplemental appropriations for various state departments and agencies or specific appropriations to the public health response to COVID-19. On the slide are three examples from Alabama, California, and Maine. 
the Alabama bill makes a supplemental appropriation from the general fund to the Department of Health to be used for coronavirus preparedness and response activities. California's appropriation is for local education agencies to, pr to purchase protective equipment and supplies and labor related to cleaning school sites. And Maine's bill makes supplemental appropriations oh. from the general fund as a one-time response. At least 12 legislatures... Did if you you're, wet um, yourself through your knee? <laughs> if you're on the line you and fall? Uh, not speaking, if you can okay. mute yourself, that would be great. Thank you. Um, great. <laughs> All right, moving on to um, public health quarantine and isolation, which are legal authorities that may be implemented to prevent the spread of communicable diseases. Um, ill people may be isolated to protect the public by preventing exposure to infected people. Quarantine may be used to restrict the movement of well people who may have been exposed to a communicable disease until it can be determined if they are ill. And CSL has a web page on state statutes related to quarantine and isolation if you want to learn more. In the last few weeks, several states introduced bills requiring employers to ensure employees would maintain their employment if they're required to be in isolation or quarantine, including the Maryland bill listed here. Washington enacted a bill related to um, including shared leave for employees in isolation or quarantine if they're ordered by a public health official or a health care provider as a result of COVID-19. There were several resolutions adopted. Here are three examples. Uh, all different examples. I included Florida's resolution declaring Florida State University the NCAA basketball champions. If you need a, a smile to get you through some of these tough times. But in all seriousness, the majority of these resolutions acknowledge the challenges coming with this pandemic. Several recognize the emergency, such as Washington DC's bill listed here, and others establish committees or task forces, such as Hawaii establishing a committee on COVID-19 related to the economic and financial preparedness. Several other states have adopted similar resolutions or enacted legislation related to task forces on COVID-19. Several bills relate to the governor's power or actions. Some of these are resolutions such as the Georgia bill listed here. New York's bill permits the governor to issue any directive necessary to respond to a disaster emergency. Maine's bill provides temporary additional power with the state of emergency declared by the governor. Several states introduced bills related to medical costs and coverage. The majority of the introduced bills from the last few weeks are still pending, so a couple of these examples on the slide are pending. For example, Alabama and New Jersey have pending bills related to Medicaid coverage. Alabama's bill relates to the postpartum coverage period for pregnant women while New Jersey's bill relates to coverage for testing and treatment of COVID-19. New Jersey uh, did pass a bill requiring health insurance and Medicaid coverage for testing and for telehealth during this state of emergency. This Maryland legislation uh, that I did refer to earlier also includes prohibiting cost sharing for disease testing, immunization, and any other associated costs. In addition to these legislative approaches, through directives by governors and state departments of insurance, at least 12 states are requiring insurers to cover medically necessary COVID-19 testing and or treatment without cost sharing to patients. A handful of states have reached agreements with insurers to waive cost sharing for patients in need of COVID-19 testing and treatment. Other states, such as Florida, Georgia, Missouri, Tennessee, and West Virginia, have requested but not required insurers to lower or remove costs for patients seeking COVID-19 testing and treatment. We've seen several bills introduced related to schools, administrative or paid leave, and employee benefits. I listed a few examples here from Iowa, Kentucky, and Mississippi. And CSL has web pages related to these topics, and we will go into more detail on these topics in future webinars. But I did wanna flag for you that we have resources um, and full web pages on these topics. 
So here are several considerations for state legislators. Review your current laws related to pandemics. This is the first time in many of our lifetimes that we've experienced a pandemic. Are your state laws still applicable? Work with your state and local health agency and hospitals. Ask them what they need. Jim, who will pre present after me, will describe the state health agency response shortly and may provide some examples of how you can do that. Lead by example in your community. Follow and share CDC and state guidelines. There is a lot of misinformation out there. Your constituents trust you and look to you for that information. Please share credible sources through your newsletters or social media, for example, CDC, the World Health Organization, and your state and local health agencies. Lastly, team up with your governor, state health official, local health official, and share a unified message or partner. Just this last weekend in Colorado, House Majority Leader Alec Garnett and House Minority Leader Patrick Neville partnered with a nonprofit and the Denver Broncos to host a personal protective equipment drive, also known as PPE, to drive support to, uh, for Colorado hospitals. Lastly, here's a list of credible resources and public health information. There are also links to our partners representing other branches of government, such as the National Governors Association and the National Center for State Courts. Here's my contact information. Please email me, Kate, or Noah with any questions you may have, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Thank you for your time today, and I'll hand it back over to Laura. Thank you so much, Tara, for that great presentation. Um, we will have questions um, and answers at the very end of the webinar. Uh, I see some of you are um, putting your questions into the audience chat box. Um, please do so throughout the webinar, and then we'll get to them at the end. Um, several of you have asked um, whether or not the webinar uh, slides are available. Those are available under the event resources tab in PDF form. And others have asked whether or not this webinar will be archived and available in the future. And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. I'm sorry for the, um, for the interference there. The answer is yes and it will be available on the NCSL website. Um, so our next presenter is Jim Blumenstock, who is the Chief Program Officer for Health Security for the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. He will cover the state health agency response, including testing, community mitigation, including quarantine, and how states are planning and preparing to take care of patients. So Jim, the floor is yours. Laura, thanks so much for that very kind introduction. And Tara, great job on, on your briefing and really providing an excellent overview of the, of the state of play um, during this historic um, public health emergency um, period and time of, in our lives. Um, there really isn't a better time than today to, to have this conversation. And I'm so pleased to hear this is just the first of a number of, of webinars that you all will be having for your, your association membership. Um, you know, Tara did a Great job sort of giving you the case count, both um, domestically and internationally. Um, but to sort of boil that down into to one sound bite, that you know, we are now in the acceleration phase of this pandemic, with the number of cases in the United States doubling every two to three days. So the, the critical importance of um, swift, um, decisive action by policymakers, leaders, and experts in every sector of our society is 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 now more important than ever um, to mobilize and work together as one, as I'm sure you have all heard and you have all said in your respective jurisdictions. So um, I am really so pleased and honored to be part of your program for today. For those of you who are not familiar with the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, uh, like NCSL, we are the national association that represents the state, the senior state and territorial public health executive leaders of those jurisdictions the 50 states, District of Columbia, and the eight Pacific and Caribbean insular jurisdictions. So our members are basically the Secretary of Health, the Commissioner of Health, the Director of Public Health in your respective um, um, states and territories. And as, as Tara had mentioned, um, in, in my honest opinion, they are clearly your best resource 
um, for credible, timely public health information. So just to reinforce the point that Tara made is that they are a source of, of information and action, and they are an excellent resource for you. So please use them and support them following all the recommendations that, that Tara has shared with you. Um, another important thing just to stress here, we talk about the ASTO family. Um, you know, we do have 59 sitting uh, members, men and women, um, but in reality, we support the 100,000 men and women that run the programs in their agencies every hour of every day. Um, and the way we do that is also in addition to supporting our members through leadership development, capacity building and technical assistance and advocacy, we provide a similar level, level and suite of services for um, many of what we call the peer groups. So or, um, mid level management agency heads um, that don't have their own national associations, such as environmental health directors, preparedness directors, and we have a list about eight to 10 of them. So we provide peer group support to them as well. We have an affiliate council um, that's made up of 21 other national associations that are outstanding in their own right, um, but work and share the public health space. So we work separately when we need to, but we work together as, as, a, as an army of public health officials um, when, when the need arises. And then again, we have an alumni society. Um, since many of our members, uh, all of our members, for the most part, work at the pleasure of the governor, um, there is turnover, but many of our um, state health officials really want to remain engaged and support um, public health um, nationwide. So through our affiliate council, we you know, keep them active. And I have to tell you, during the, during the COVID-19 response, um, they have really stood up and many of our alumni who are either in a retired mode or actually functioning in other areas of public and private sector are actively engaged as well. So when we talk about the public health imperative, um, you've heard this many times again, but it's worth repeating. Um, sort of our mantra is to contain and mitigate. And containment and mitigation is without a doubt um, the only way that we can delay entry and slow the spread of this disease and by, by so flattening the curve. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about containment because for, for in large part, um, we sort of process through that phase and, and most of our focus, not all of our focus, but most of our focus is on mitigation. But to sort of give you a sense of exactly what the public health, oh, if someone would be kind enough to mute themselves, thank you. Um, to give you just sort of a sense of um, what were the containment strategies and tactics since January um, when we as a nation mobilized? Um, putting aside for a moment the travel restrictions of, of, of foreign nationals coming into the United States from certain parts of China, um, one of the roles that public health played was supporting um, the Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection, and the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine at CDC to really staff and man what we were calling the funneling airports. We started with five, it grew to 11, and now there are 13. And basically this was an approach whereby whether they be US citizens or other foreign nationals coming into the United States had to be funneled through these airports where they had enhanced screening to determine their risk and their status of health. Uh, and this was a critically important containment effort to rapidly identify those who were at risk that needed to be put into a quarantine or self-isolation model and those that actually were ill um, and needed medical care. Um, that type of surface service was also provided through a, a very large repatriation, repatriation effort where the Department of State, Department of Defense, and other federal agencies worked to bring home U.S. citizens from affected parts of the country through a very structured process of going into approximately five states and to military um, designated facilities where they were closely monitored and while they were on the while they were on military bases they clearly relied relied on state and local public health and assets to provide the necessary wraparound services to ensure that their medical creature comfort and basically hospitalities were, were needed and supported um, for those military um, bases so that sort of gives you a sense of the level of containment but really what i want to do is talk about um, mitigation because while these are two steps, they are, they are not linear or sequ sequential. So right now we are, we are in sort of an area where we're doing both, uh, but not at the same uh, level of, of vigor as, as we once did with, with containment. Um, there's still a containment effort going on to make sure that we do identify and separate or isolate those travelers coming back into the United States that still may come from a high-risk country, 
but in large part, most of our effort around the country is focusing on mitigation, which I will now talk about. So the, the key public health capabilities and functions um, for this type of infectious disease response, response, you can see them sort of labeled here or identified here in, in very large buckets. Um, these are not unique to COVID-19. These would be the suite of capacities and functions that state and territorial public health would do and have been doing in every other public health emergency, whether it be the H1N1 pandemic in 2009, um, Ebola, Zika, uh, even this past year with the measles outbreaks that really blossomed in um, several uh, communities across the country. Um, this is what public health does, uh, and this is clearly their their service and contributions to the COVID-19 uh, response. Um, so just quickly give the, high, the highlights, and again, you can see there's a lot of overlap and, and consistency with other sectors of state government. Um, you know, your Homeland Security unit, your uh, state emergency management unit, um, in many respects, they follow sort of the same typical path or, or suite of activities and services. Uh, public health is responsible for incident management. Um, you know, clearly bringing in all the assets uh, of an agency requires a structured, a structured incident management system. Uh, every public health agency has an emergency operations center with trained and qualified personnel to do their very best, not only to manage their agency's response, but also to integrate and align with that of the governor, as well as the designated um, representative of the governor. That, in most cases, that's the state emergency management official. Um, another area is around information management. Not only, not only the intelligence and analysis of data coming in to really get a good picture of sort of the deep disease progression and the risks to the community, um, but this, you know, there's a spinoff here of information management, and that also includes risk communications. Um, in COVID-19, um, proper and sound risk communications drives proper risk management. Uh, and public health was quite active, really trying to um, neutralize a lot of the mis- and disinformation that was being provided around COVID-19, a lot of which, which actually stimulated um, unfortunate stigmatization um, across the country, um, you know, basically, you know, from people who had, you know, who had epic origins um, that were aligned with, you know, sort of the earlier outbreaks in, in, in China. Um, so that was what public health really tried to do was neutralize and really educate the public as to um, what the what the truths are and bust the myths around um, the threat and risk associated with the disease. Um, countermeasures and mitigation. Um, you know, they sort of go hand in hand. Um, with COVID-19, as Tara had mentioned, um, you know, countermeasures right now is not a very large response component um, because there's no vaccine and there's no specific medical treatment such as an antibiotic or antiviral. That will become increasingly important as time goes on because if COVID is one of those diseases that basically has phases or cycles or waves, um, if, if this does, quote, die off in, as, as the summer months approach, um, it could certainly mimic the pattern of what we're seeing with seasonal flu, it reappearing or resurfacing in the fall or early winter. So the importance of vaccine um, and, and, and other medical medicals like antivirals is important for, for treatment of, of ill individuals. And of course, all of the all of the mitigation strategies, which I want to talk about in a few moments as well. Um, surge management is, is critically important, not only for the public health system, but also for the healthcare system. Um, identifying ways in which they can increase the workforce using volunteers, um, other types of uh, pre-identified and pre-approved um, medical personnel that could, um, you know, do interstate. Um, travel to work in other jurisdictions for license uh, reciprocity, the use of reserve uh, forces is another example. Regarding physical plant, um, the importance of finding alternative care sites if, if, if they need a building to, um, whether to screen or triage individuals to separate sick from, from well visitors, that's a critical importance. And of course, if the number of cases really exceed uh, in, in the capacity of a facility of finding sites that can uh, safely and effectively manage um, not only COVID patients, but other individuals requiring hospital care um, that need to be in, a, in an off building um, as part of the hospital as, as a temporary facility. 
biosurveillance, um, critically important to find out where the disease is, how is it spreading, how are your mitigation efforts working, and also having the clinical laboratory testing capability to rapidly diagnose cases so those individuals could be properly treated um, and, and cared for. And the last one, which I actually going to close with um, in a few moments, is the issue of jurisdictional recovery. Um, again, critically important because um, like every other public health emergency, when you talk about returning to normalcy and the resilience of a community, recovery um, and reestablishment of routine program services and activities is critically important. So while you know, we're all optimistic in looking forward to that recovery phase, it's never too soon to start thinking and planning for how you're gonna capture this experience um, and how it influenced your recovery approaches so you can get back to normal and a, and a sort of a steady state as quickly as possible. The, the public health priorities, um, again, these are sort of a little more specific as to sort of the capabilities I talked about. Again, I did touch on, on risk communications. Can't, can't stress that enough as far as having an informed, um, comfortable, confident and trusted members of, of the public uh, relying on credible uh, information from state public health um, officials, from the administration and from state legislatures. Um, the issue of infection control, specifically protective, um, personal protective equipment, PPE, um, state and territorial public health has been spending a tremendous time, amount of time and effort trying to um, ascertain and, and acquire sufficient amounts of respiratory protection, gloves, gowns, gas, um, gloves, gowns, masks, uh, everything that would basically protect the worker as well as protect or prevent the worker from transmitting an infection from one patient to another. Um, areas that, that state health departments are looking at are obviously carefully managing the caches that they currently have in state stockpiles, uh, finding opportunities to purchase whatever's left out in the commercial supply chain, uh, having systems in place um, which have been in place for 15 years to work with the U.S. government to request and accept strategic national stockpile assets um, to augment state supplies, um, to properly disperse them to facilities in need. And then obviously, as a last resort, finding ways in which um, the current equipment can possibly reuse, be reused, uh, other types of sparing uh, strategies and tactics, including a lot of what's been talked about today is uh, ways in which um, homemade types of products as a last resort um, could be considered. Um, we talked about rapid detection of cases and testing not only for your traditional um, physician and hospital um, clinical setting where they are really taking care of sick people to ensure that they can get the rapid testing, but also um, in recently the, the option of setting up mobile testing sites. Um, again, it's not a novel approach. Um, mobile, mobile sites have been used and considered for a lot of other public health initiatives, such as uh, seasonal flu vaccinations, as well as ways in which, if we heaven forbid, had an act of terrorism, let's say through anthrax, would be a mechanism by the pub way public health would, would administer or distribute um, antibiotics. So that's being considered as one option to increase, increase volume and throughput. Again, we talked about um, medical surge of really trying to identify those ways to ensure that the health the healthcare workforce stays healthy, it stays in sufficient supply, um, to meet the needs of the, of the patients and also the, the facilities and equipment are sufficient um, to provide the service as well. And some offshoots of medical surge is a lot of exploration around telemedicine, ways in which um, that technology can be used not only to be a more protective social distancing method, but ways to provide um, sort of enhanced or augmented um, medical care feature. A um, lot, of, lot of activity clearly with social distancing, sort of the idea of, of stay at home. You are all very familiar with what your states are doing, what the, uh, the, the White House task force is doing um, on the way to just sort of use this as a very critically important mechanism so that the disease, the infection is not transmitted from one person to another. Um, and we, I'm sure during our questions and answers, there will be a lot of discussion uh, on that topic as well, so I won't dwell on it. And again, crisis standards of care. Um, you know, this is, this is basically an approach where uh, facilities and jurisdictions have to establish a plan and procedures and criteria to make very difficult decisions. Um, when, when there are um, patients in need and you do not have enough supply or equipment to meet everyone's needs, 
you have to make those tough decisions. And and right now, um, government agencies as well as facilities are really being encouraged to, to really refresh their crisis standards of care under the COVID-19 scenario to, um, you know, really address the needs as, as objective, as scientific, um, and as ethical as possible. So I wanted to do in closing is just share with you uh, some documents um, that we have on our website. And I do this for two purposes. Um, number one, I believe it's a good resource to you um, at our website at asto.org, but it also gives you a sense of um, what's on our members' minds. Um, because obviously as a national association, the work we do, the products we produce are designed and influenced by what's trending and what our members um, tell us as far as being critically important. So here's, here's just a, a screenshot of our landing page. Um, you can get a flavor for it. And again, you know, the URL is in the slide deck. I would really encourage everyone to, to visit uh, us. And here is just a quick list of some of the materials that we have posted released recently, which I want to highlight for you before I close. Um, he was one early on um, where there was a lot of interest of what states were doing regarding emergency declarations. So, you know, here's not only a graphic, but also a drill down where you can click and identify very similar to the resources that Tara showed you of what um, states have done and states and territories on their issuance of emergency declarations. Um, what we've also done is created a, um, a new tool, and it's basically, it's, you know, it's, it's not an FAQ document. It is a targeted um, set of answers to very difficult questions our members have been receiving. Um, and it's through a message map, map, message map format. So unlike the excellent FAQs that are posted on many federal agencies' documents, um, you, this one basically provides a more dr a deeper drilled down type of message map of how to answer specific questions. So for our state health officials or other members um, who, you know, are speaking to policymakers, members of the press, or members who are concerned in town hall meetings, this really is a good resource for them to, um, to really rely upon to answer specific questions. Um, we have 45 in the library, and we are constantly updating and expanding that. Another couple of examples is um, the using, using telemedicine to reduce health care workers, as I talked about. Um, you know, last week there was a great interest in knowing what states were doing on, on restaurant restrictions to ensure not only that social distancing was maintained, but also the safety of the food that was being served was that it was maintained as well. So we did a scan of states on, on that. So in closing, just my, my, my recommendations or advice would be, as, as Tara had mentioned, um, focusing on continuity, continuity of operations, not only of your office, of your chamber, but also of your constituents, um, especially those who, those companies and businesses that provide essential services to your community, um, they need to main, they need to continue to operate and um, making sure that there are no barriers such as um, curfews and other types of uh, policies would in, impede their travel to work or the delivery of product. Um, the issue of administrative and legal preparedness, um, ensuring that there are no barriers in place. Um, there will be a significant amount of federal money coming to many state agencies. Um, the purpose here is obviously to um, rap rapidly accession those funds into functional services and activities and, and removing any um, traditional sort of blue sky type, uh, blue sky day type of barriers would, would be recommended. I talked a little bit about recovery, and, and part of the recovery is obviously the mental, um, mental health and well being of the communities that are impacted. Um, after action review and improvement planning, um, again, the key importance here is that there could be additional waves of COVID 19. And I think as we have seen, there will be, there will be another major infectious disease event in our lifetime. Um, so whatever we learn today um, could, be, could help improve the future response activities. And resourcing readiness. Um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that these types of responses um, do take uh, a tremendous amount of resourcing, um, not only to, to ensure the appropriate level of preparedness, but also um, the response and recovery access as, aspects as well. So in close, my closing thought is public health is a matter of national security, and I really do appreciate the, the time here to spend with you to give you this quick overview. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim, for taking the time to be with us today and for that excellent presentation.
Um, I'm just going to remind the participants um, to log your questions in the audience chat, and we'll get to them after um, our third presenter. So uh, let me introduce her right now. Our next presenter is Haley Nicholson, who directs NCSL's state federal work on health and human services. She'll outline the federal response to date, including president executive actions, recent appropriation bills, and what it means for states, the federal HHS response, and more. So Haley, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Jim and Tara. Um, I'm gonna go through the federal response in a few different aspects, as Laura said. Uh, my slides might have a little bit more detail than what I'm covering, but for the purposes of time and giving some time for Q&A, happy to follow up after this if people have more detailed questions. And so here's a quick overview of the agenda what and then what I'll cover. And then this is a quick timeline of federal action that's been happening since January 31st up until last week in regards to presidential action and congressional action in providing um, emergency resources for COVID-19 response. So the presidential efforts, I'll say, on this next slide, it's the breakdown of different national health emergency declaration and different acts that the president has declared he's under. I am not the go-to expert for that in our office. That's actually Lucia Bragg, who is on the phone and is happy to answer questions in our Q&A, and if you want to type those in now. Um, there's also an ongoing information alert that Lucia has where she's been updating information. But to give you some of the major timelines, January 31st with the first declaration uh, permitted uh, HHS Secretary Alex Azar to establish the Coronavirus Task Force. Um, and then the second one on March 13th fell under um, the Stafford Act and National Emergencies Act. And this allows each act, different agencies, um, ways to modify certain requirements for different health and human service programs, ensuring that people can access care and give a little bit more flexibility uh, for the duration of the pandemic. And then the most recent one, uh, action by the president, it invoked emergency authorities under the Defense Production Act. And this is looking at um, requiring private industry folks to prioritize their government contracts with a focus on um, the production of medical supplies. Um, and so, as I said, there's a lot more detail under those and those resources are also linked um, on our slides. For congressional efforts, um, there's been three different packages. One is in the works as we speak, as we're hosting this webinar. Uh, the first one was HR 6074. This gave out 8.3 billion in appropriations. Um, and this included a little over 1 billion in grants to reimburse states and local governments uh, for the cost that they've already incurred during COVID-19 response efforts and for future anticipated costs. As you can see, this is broken down by a couple different federal agencies and administrations and for specific programs that they work with. And the next slide gives an even more detailed um, breakdown of different HHS and other federal agencies and the funding they received under this first emergency uh, response. We also wanted to highlight on March 11th that the CDC put out a chart and if you go to the link Underneath this graph here, it will take you and it breaks down for all of the states, um, the funding that went out under this first bill to states and local jurisdictions and the corresponding accounts. And the CD also up, CDC also announced um, following this an 80 million to tribes, tribal organizations and urban Indian organizations. Now, there was another bill that passed, and I'll, I might interchangeably say bill and package, it's being referred to as both in Congress um, the second was HR 6201, Families First Coronavirus Responses Act. This contained a number of provisions. So in terms of looking at impact of public health issues, um, there was 64 million provided to the Indian Health Service for item and services. Um, this also allowed uh, HHS to provide some liability protection for emergency response products. There was also uh, quite a bit of funding for food and nutrition programs. For the next few slides on this, I'm just gonna kind of slowly click through and just give everyone a quick overview because there is an upcoming webinar where we're gonna cover nutrition services, but I wanted people to have this reference point if they'd like it now, and always happy to follow up uh, if you have questions before that next webinar. So here's broken down by different communities, 
um, different sites for nutrition access as it applies to different programs. And then in that bill, there was also some, there was also provisions that will help address health coverage and services for COVID-19. Um, unfortunately, a side effect that patients are seeing is unexpected uh, surprise medical billing addressed with testing costs and cover and services. And so the bill addressed this by providing 1.2 billion to cover some of the testing costs. It's also requiring commercial insurers to cover testing and diagnosis with no cost sharing to the patient. And it's also appropriating over, uh, 1 billion to the National Disaster Medical System so that they can get costs reimbursed for the, when they're testing uninsured individuals who are under Medicaid and Medicare and some other uh, insurance plans. Um, states will also, they're also eligible for a 6.2 increase in their uh, Medicaid federal medical assist percentages, also known as FMAP, and that applies to the regular FMAP rate, not expansion rate. Um, there will be no cost sharing for Medicaid and children's health insurance, CHIP enrollees, and 100% FMAP to cover the costs. Um, increased funding to all U.S. territories for the next two fiscal years. And a big one um, that came out that's been highlighted is um, any cost sharing for seniors enrolled under Medicare Part B and Medicare Advantage. And I say a big highlight because this is probably one of the most vulnerable populations to COVID-19. And the technical improvements and flexibilities in telehealth became key, not only providing them services for COVID-19, seeing if they need to be tested or coming in, but for the services they need every day and making sure if they don't need to come to a hospital right now, they should not, and they can get as much of that uh, service as they can at home. And so the recent package, the one that is being discussed as we speak, um, the third package, there's been a couple different iterations. Um, yesterday, the Senate held two votes to try and get a 60 vote threshold. So that would limit the debate on the third package and let it proceed to legislation. Um, that proposal was a Senate Republican proposal on S3548. And the bill breaks down, um, it's a largely looking at economic surplus and recovery. And again, there will be a webinar on those aspects, but that it did have some HHS provisions, including on supply shortages, access to healthcare, innovation and healthcare workforce. So some overlap from what we've seen in the other two packages, kind of building on top of each other, in some instances, clarifying from a previous um, what's been passed. The supply shortages, they're really focusing on working with national groups. What do we have in our strategic national stockpile? What is needed? And also looking at not just what's going on in the COVID-19 situation, but what can Congress learn from the situation and make recommendations and ensure that any kind of shortages or things that states needed or feedback that they can get, um, that, that, that the preparedness is there, or that is enhanced um, oh, from what states have uh, been doing and what the feds can provide to them. Um, there's also a big provision in there for uh, prescription drug manufacturers and looking at supply chains, um, backup supply, um, overall just making sure that people have access to essential prescriptions during this time. Obviously things can get redirected. Um, people have different mentalities when they want to go and get different prescriptions. They may want to go and get ahead because they're not going to leave their house or they're very limited. Um, so there's a lot of different provisions also at looking at prescription drug manufacturers and kind of that side of this as well. Um, excuse me. So access to health care, a um, couple different provisions that were added in, a suspension of Medicare sequestration that was had been planned um, and an increase in Medicare payments for those patients that do test positive for COVID-19. Um, there's also an inclusion of $1.32 billion to community health centers. This uh, number can come from that funding was supposed to be there. The community health centers were going to receive a reauthorization in May was the deadline. And so a lot of people have been saying that this number could come from this is essentially taking care of that situation because regular order is uncertain at this point. And obviously, they're a big part of the response. Um, also clarifying again on this insurance point for private insurance plans that for testing for COVID-19, there's no cost sharing to pa patients and that when and if a potential vaccine is developed, that that is at no cost to a patient. 
Um, there's also a number of provisions in the bill that relate to rural health populations and the unique um, situation they're facing in, the, in COVID-19 in terms of access to care and things that they would need to take into consideration. And then clarifications um, on liability protections. Some providers are being asked to cross state lines to assist their colleagues. And so looking at increased flexibility support for them and for those also that participate in the National Health Sur Service Corps during this emergency period. Innovation really quickly is just looking at different um, government partners having more flexibility to work with the private sector and research and development, big focus on vaccine development. The healthcare workforce piece um, is looking to reauthorize and update um, the Title VII of Public Health Service Act. And what this really encompasses the healthcare workforce is looking at um, the current training, training that is needed, faculty development, and ensuring that those that are on the front lines providing services across healthcare workforce, um, that they're prepared, that they have what they need, and also preparing them for future emergencies. What is working? What do they need? Um, and so it's just giving a lot of flexibilities, but also tracking what uh, healthcare workforce will need and um, if should this happen again, but also what they need directly on the ground now. Uh, and so, like I said, there's a couple different proposals. The Senate Democrats have a proposal as well. The House Democrats have a proposal. This is a quick overview of some of the funding the Senate Democrats have proposed. Uh, of note, $2 billion set aside for state and local reimbursement. Um, as of now, it sounds like the Senate is working to get a vote done, a uh, language done and negotiated, and a vote done by tonight. Uh, the House has to give their members 24 hours notice before returning to vote. Um, and so the Senate is anticipating if they can get this done tonight, they'd like to give that notice because they know the House is ready to move quickly as well. So they're working out a couple of different proposals. The funding level is a little different. And again, this package also covers economic and uh, recovery supports. Um, so we are closely monitoring that situation. I'm going to do finally just two federal agency updates. Um, I do recommend, this is at the end of the slide, uh, we have, NCSL has a federal agency announcement page. This is across all federal agencies and issues. This is highlighting, uh, there's so much different information coming out um, on a daily basis. So we want to track that for you all and provide you links when necessary. Um, the one I want to highlight is that the FDA had made an update to a policy they issued later in February. And what this policy will do, it deals with um, testing for COVID-19. Um, it's putting in place a policy that states will take responsibility for the tests developed and used in labs in their states. Um, some of people may have heard about this. New York State was granted this a few weeks ago. The guidance that FDA put out is not mirroring what is being done in New York. It's an example, um, but they wanted to connect those two. And then basically states can now just engage directly with their appropriate state authorities and labs instead of waiting for different FDA requirements they may have to in the past. There's also some language in there around emergency use authorization um, and the FDA's efforts to help uh, labs in that pro if they're doing an emergency use authorization, um, just granting those out, providing templates and advice for the labs looking at those, but giving states a lot more flexibility in this process. And then finally, um, oh, pardon me, uh, there have been a couple of different announcements on the development of a vaccine for COVID-19. There is a trial being done in Washington state on healthy adults. Um, there's daily announcements. There's probably only so much information that I'm able to share, but that's one part of the discussion. Um, there's also been discussion within the administration about potentially promoting an anti-malarial drug to use for treatment. The drug, I forgive me, I cannot pronounce it, and I'm not going to pretend that I can try, um, but the name is in my slide. Um, and some are saying studies when the drug is combined with an antibiotic, this can treat COVID-19 or help with symptoms. Um, the FDA has discussed this treatment in other vaccine developments, and they're highlighting that more trials and evidence are needed in this and other instances. And I have a link to the full release that they did on that. Um, we've also heard from a number of uh, different private companies who are conducting trials for a vaccine at this time. They're obviously in an unprecedented timeline, and so FDA is being flexible where they can and still ensuring safety 
in those developments when needed. And so finally, these are some of the resources we've released. I wanted to also thank Margaret Weil in the DC office. Uh, she works on Health and Human Services with me. She's been a huge assistance and help in putting together these materials, other materials. We are both happy to follow up with you on any federal piece that I've discussed today. I know it was done quickly. Um, and as, like I said, the Senate package, these are not final details until it's voted on. So please um, bear with us as we wait for that. And then we will send out what we know and give a great overview as soon as that vote is done. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone and thank you all for all the work you're doing in your states and communities. Thank you so much, Haley, for that terrific update on the federal response and a uh, reminder to our participants of NCSL's resources. Uh, I also want to remind everyone uh, that we have, um, tomorrow we have a webinar on continuity of state governments and elections at 1230. On Friday, we have uh, fiscal and economic issues. And uh, on March 31st, we have workforce and labor issues. And on April 3rd, education, child care, and nutrition. And we will have an infrastructure webinar, but we haven't, um, we haven't slated it yet. Um, that'll, that information will be coming soon. Uh, so now we're going to start our Q&A. And um, we have a few questions from the audience. Now's the time uh, to put those in there. I'm going to ask um, Jim and, um, and Haley. Um, there's a question uh, coming to us from California, um, and uh, let's see. To what extent can the administration, federal government, override state efforts to contain and mitigate the disease? So, Jim, you want to try um, take a, a stab at it first? Sure. So, um, you know, I, I'm not, not a lawyer. Um, but I think under some of the emergency powers that the government, that the president and other um, leaders of the federal government have, um, you know, it is, I guess, it, you know, theoretically possible that the governor could set a standard that is much more stringent than a state is currently doing with regards to containment and mitigation. Um, I guess but from my vantage point, I, I think what I'm seeing, quite frankly, is the states around the country individually being more aggressive than the current um, recommendations from the White House concerning the 15-day uh, guidelines for America. So, you know, for example, I live in New Jersey. Um, so what New Jersey and New York State are experiencing, their social distancing um, uh, executive directives and orders and uh, advice to the members of the public are clearly um, much more stringent, much more aggressive than the 15-day um, national guideline that was issued by the president's um, task force last weekend. And you, Jim? Uh, I'm also not a lawyer, so um, I know Lucia, who's on the line with us, has also looked into this, and we're happy to follow up. There's kind of a few different moving parts on this. Um, the only thing we're thinking possibly applicable, the National Emergencies Act, and we do have a blog up on that, um, and kind of what that authorizes the president to do. But in regards to this specific question, I would actually ask if we could get your contact information because there's a few, like I said, move, moving parts that we'd want to kind of put together in a response to you. And then um, if other folks want to respond on this as well, if you could put in your information or my uh, contact information is on my slides, email me directly, whatever is easiest for you. Thanks, Haley. This next question is also for you. Um, so just mute your phone until, um, until you respond. Um, regarding federal funds, what will state matches have to be? Is this clearly stated in the federal bills? Over to you, Haley. Um, so uh, the state matches in terms of uh, different Medicaid programs, I think is what they're asking about. Um, that, as far as I know, the states, the bills are not special. There's no match that I just know that the feds are saying that they will, it's a hundred percent F match for Medicaid and CHIP for those programs. So the state match isn't on there. And then the only other 
as that piece that I uh, that I highlighted earlier is the 6.2, and that's over the federal regular match rate. And um, as far as the Senate, there was a little bit of conversation about going above the 6.2, but I don't know if that's gotten movement. Um, and, and I can look and clarify, but on the state matches, I that I hadn't heard that that was off, that that was going to be required, but they were just covering under the different programs I mentioned earlier. Thank you, Haley. Um, this question is for Jim. A concern that we keep hearing about is ventilator use, availability, and allocation. Are there guidelines or resources for state leaders on how to tackle a possible shortage? It's a great question, and that certainly is um, a critically important topic at this point in time. Um, actually, today on ASTO's website, we posted a one-pager on that very specific topic. So in the interest of time, I won't highlight it for you other than to say there's, there, are, there are summary statements, there are links to federal and industry resources, and there are also examples of what various states have done to date on the issue of prioritization, allocation, and um, capacity, uh, including not only the instruments themselves, but also approaches to, again, the ethical decisions around their use in limited uh, quantities, and obviously the, the, the healthcare personnel, such as the in intensivists and the pulmonologists that also need to be in, 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 in sufficient quantity to provide the medical and clinical determination and supervision of, those, of that equipment. So that, that would be, I think, a good go-to resource, and I would be glad to follow up specifically if you have any questions or need more information. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, there's another question for you. And it's, and it's related to um, uh, something that you mentioned in your presentation. Uh, one of our uh, participants wants some ideas or examples on jurisdictional recovery and review and improvement planning. If you could, um, if you could just maybe expand a little bit on that. Sure. So um, that that's a great question, and it's a pretty easy one to answer, simply because. Um, you know, the, every, jur every jurisdiction, whether it be federal agency, state, or local, in many respects are required to do structured after-action reports, reviews, and improvement plans. Uh, a lot of that is also required through some of the federal grants and cooperative agreements they get. So my recommendation would be to, to speak with your state's emergency management director or your Homeland Security Advisor or your state health commissioner or secretary and, and see what recent ones they've done, whether it be for exercises or real-world events, um, such as the measles outbreak, Zika, Ebola, a, a major flood. Um, you can get a, a sense of a look and feel as to what it contains. Um, the process, the objective, uh, frank self-assessment of performance, um, and that clearly would be uh, in appropriate for, for the COVID-19. Um, the other point to mention is you don't have to wait till the incident is over to do that. Um, there is sort of a similar process called an IPR, an in-progress review, um, where you, you know, in the middle of response, you take that two-minute timeout and assess your strengths, weaknesses, your gaps and, and flaws, and try to make sort of the midterm corrections so you finish stronger than you would have if you didn't take that time to, to examine yourself. So uh, again, I'd be glad to provide more examples or resources, but I think um, the best thing for state legislators to do would be see what, what their specific state does and maybe some recent tools that they've created uh, that would satisfy that. Thanks, Thank you. Jim. Um, Tara, you mentioned in your presentation um, that the legislature in Colorado partnered with the Denver Broncos for, for personal protective equipment drive. Are there other examples of legislators involved in mitigating the pandemic um, that aren't legislative? Yeah, thank you for that, that question, Laura. And absolutely. I, I do want to mention a lot of state legislators, um, it's, that's not their full-time job, as many of you on this webinar know. And there are actually several legislators that work in the healthcare field. Um, and so there's some interesting articles coming fr from legislators talking about their experience actually working in the healthcare field. 
I would also share that uh, the Republican leadership in Kansas, they launched Kansas Together, a, corona, a Kansas Coronavirus Resource Center. So they partnered uh, with several agencies in the state. Um, in North Carolina, uh, Speaker Tim Moore announced the formation of a bipartisan North Carolina House Select Committee on COVID-19. And then uh, there are several legislators, including Oregon House Speaker Tina uh, Kotek, who posted on several social media platforms encouraging people to donate their extra personal protective equipment. Um, so there are quite a lot of examples of different ways that you can be involved um, outside of introducing legislation. Thanks, Sarah. This will be our last question because I'm, I want to be sensitive to uh, the time. Um, Haley, um, what role can states play in providing flexibility um, for health coverage when it comes to COVID-19 testing and treatment? Um, so states have worked with, actually there is a blog on NCSL about this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, patients were starting to get concerned under different plans that when they went in for testing or getting treatment, if they tested positive, they were getting surprise medical bills. Um, and so a number of different states, and I would refer everyone to check this blog. I worked with Jack Stroer in our Denver office on this. A number of states have implemented on the plans that they can regulate, um, ensuring that people are not faced with having a cost sharing or issues with surprise billing for these kinds of services and um, for the testing as well. Um, so if you're looking for some specific state examples of what was done, and then as I mentioned federally, there in both of the bills that have passed, um, federal folks are also trying to support states in that work and that, again, ensuring especially for testing and services related to this, that an insurer is not then coming back to the patient with a bill some kind of surprise medical billing component to that. Um, and so folks have further questions on that, please follow up. Jack and mine's contact information is on that as well, but states within the plans that they do regulate, they can um, add in some of those flexibilities and ensure that people are not worried about the cost sharing or surprise billing aspect. Thanks, Haley. And I'd like to thank I'd like to thank our presenters again for sharing their time and expertise on today's webinar. Um, I'd like to thank our audience for joining us. And in the next week or so, we'll post the recording um, on our webpage and the PowerPoint um, is available in PDF on the tab um, labeled resources. Thank you all for your participation and stay well. And I'd also like to um, apologize for some of the interference that we're getting. We're all at home working on our cell phones. <laughs> so so uh, uh, please give us a little uh, grace on that. Um, thank you so much and stay well.